Welcome to week three. The weather's nice today. A little nicer than yesterday. Today was a little toasty. Um, we're going to start getting into diagramming this week. So now that we've covered what entities are and attributes and we've learned normalized data, now we're going to start learning how to diagram. That'll be this week and next week. Um, specifically this week, we're going to focus on conceptual diagramming. So database modeling is the process of creating diagrams with varying levels of complexity. So there's three common types of database diagrams. There's actually half a dozen or more database diagrams, but they serve different purposes. Um, but these are the three, when we're talking about designing a database, these are the three types we're talking about. The conceptual. The conceptual is actually broken down into two types, the traditional and the extended. Um, the logical, which is the next logical step in creating the database model. I wish I hadn't put that pun in there. Um, but it is literally the next step after you create the conceptual. And then you have the physical, which is the final diagram, which the action is targeted at a specific database engine. So that's the diagram that is targets Oracle or MySQL or Postgres or whatever. Um, logical is basically the abstracted version of the physical diagram. It has everything there that the physical has without any of the server specific touches. All right, and I've got a typo. Man, let's go fix that right now. There we go, that makes more sense. Pretty sure that I was creating the year 9000. Um, as you can see, I actually typed these slides out <laughs> from a textbook that's sitting on my shelf. Um, all right, conceptual diagrams. The conceptual diagram, which is the original database diagram, was created initially in 1976 by a data scientist called Peter Chen. Literally, I was a one year old when these diagrams came out. So just to put it in perspective of how long they've been around. The original version of the diagram included only entities and relationships. It used two symbols. Entities have a rectangle. Relationships are represented by a diamond. Uh, the type of relationship was identified by actual notation on the diagram. So you'd have uh, one, one, one N or MM. I've also seen it written as NM. Um, so essentially it means it's one to one, one to many, many to many. Um, over the years, slightly different variations of this have occurred. Do you have a question? So it's one to one, one to many, many to many. I've, like I said, I've seen it written multiple ways. Um, over the years, like I said, I've seen, uh, one, one, one N I've also seen one M I've seen M M and N M. It depends on where you went to school and whether or not they were following something that had typos in it. Um, like I said, I've seen it written multiple ways. So there's an example at the bottom of a person and a location where a location, so each person has a single birthplace, but each location can have multiple people born there. That's how you'd read this. So you're saying that each person was born in one, let's go back. Each person was born in one location and each location can have many people, one N. Uh, usually, as you'll notice, the 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 part of the notation that identifies the relationship for a given entity is at the other end of the line. So if you're talking about the person, the one's over here. If you're talking about the location, the N is over here, saying that this location has many people, this person has one location. Usually when people start diagramming, this is one of the things that trip them up because of where the notation goes. So over the years, 
the diagram involved um, a bunch of other stuff was added uh, because people said, Peter, this is cool. There's not enough detail. We want more detail. So more detail was added. We added symbols for attributes. Uh, new symbols for entities and relationships were created. Um, and a different notation style for the relationships. Um, once these were added, the diagrams became known as the extended conceptual diagram. So in other words, you had the basic diagram, which was just the entities and the relationship, and then you had other things added on. Now, just to go back to this for a second, one of the big advantages of this particular diagram is it's not hard to explain to a layperson. So you have clients and you need to explain to them how their data is interconnected. Two symbols and one notation is not hard to explain to someone and actually get them to understand it. So then you can go over what you've discovered about their data in a simplified manner. That's one of the big advantages of conceptual diagrams. Strangely enough, conceptual diagrams are trying to go out of style. They don't teach it as much as they used to. Why? I don't know, not complicated enough? Um, personally, I'm a big fan of keeping things simple when you're learning. All right, so attributes, which we know by now are the things that describe an entity, are represented by ovals. However, there's different kinds of attributes and they're represented by different kinds of ovals. Identifiers are underlined. So when we're diagramming, we want to put in an identifier. We put it in with an underline. You can look at the diagram right away. This one right here, it's underlined. If it's an optional attribute, which, you know, we talked about that when we were talking about attributes a couple of weeks ago, where when we're defining an entity, we may have attributes that are optional because not everybody has a fax, for example. It has an O inside of it. So this one right here. So this little symbol here that looks like a person going like this is uh, and stands for an O. Uh, derived attributes are dashed circles, like the age right here. Um, usually when we're doing the conceptual diagramming and we're doing the initial data discovery, we will still include derived attributes at this point because they still have business meaning. It's just later on, we'll figure out how to calculate them. And a composite attribute is enclosed in parentheses. And then may or may not have the component pieces included. So right down here, the address. You'll see the address is in parentheses. And for those of you that don't know what a parentheses is, a lot of time you hear it called a bracket in programming. They're not brackets, they're parentheses. Brackets are square. They're the ones above the enter key. Just so you know, um, they're the same key as the ones with the braces. Um, terminology is important in computers. As you can, it irritates me when people don't call things the right thing. So what this is showing is that the address is made up of multiple things. And in this case, when I was drawing this example to put on the slide, I said, you know what? I'll show you guys what it looks like when you include the, the, the component attributes. So the address is made up of a street address, city, region, also known as a province, state, whatever, and a postal code. So all of this whole chunk right here is all one thing. Some people choose to not include the component pieces. That's cool. But if you know it's made up of multiple pieces, you should at least denote it in the diagram by putting it in parentheses. All right, so these are the big attribute types. And after they decided to expand the different kind of items, uh, such as the entities and the relationships, they said, well, you know, we need to know more about the relationships. We need to know more about the entities. So new symbols were added to the mix in order to better represent the varying type of entities and the relationships. A weak entity lives in a double box. So if you remember, a weak entity is an entity that requires 
pieces of an entity to exist. It cannot exist by itself, like a loan payment cannot exist without a loan. Associative entities are identified by a diamond in a box. So an associative entity is used to connect two other entities. So some people call them intersection tables. Um, the thing is, is that an associative entity will often have extra attributes past the association. Um, I'll be doing some examples of that at some point. Um, and then identifying relationships are represented by a double diamond. So normally you'll have a regular entity, a weak entity, and then the double diamond will show the relationship between the two because one is identifying the other. Um, but the biggest change to all of this was the notation changes for relationships. So as database design concepts evolved, and as we all know, everybody in computing thinks they can do it better than the other person, which is why we have a couple hundred, if not a thousand programming languages, a million different JavaScript libraries, and how many flavors of Linux are exist out there right now? Because everybody thinks they can do it better than somebody else. So the computing world kept arguing over the different ways of creating notation. And one became really, really popular in North America and basically started being adopted elsewhere. Um, it's known as crow's foot. Uh, because of the shape of the many side looks like, you know, like a bird's foot. Uh, so I asked a data scientist called Gordon Everett in 1976 actually wrote an article that described this notation method, but it hadn't been adopted yet. And then, you know, people took it and ran and it eventually caused the notation to, to evolve into what it became. Um, I've seen at least nine other database relationship notations. Um, one of the big ones that used to be used in Europe a lot is known as ID1Fix. Uh, it's also used often in South America. Brazil, for example, was really big for ID1Fix. I eventually had to admit that since the rest of the world was moving to crow's foot, they also had to go to crow's foot. Um, Germany is really fixed on ID1Fix for some unknown reason. They just don't want to let it go because they think it's better. Um, but the rest of the world is basically accepted that crow's foot's the way to go. Okay. So the reason why crow's foot is so much better than most of the others is the fact that it's able to identify both cardinality and optionality. So cardinality means how many instances participate in the relationship, one or many, right? So you have one, you have a person and a birthplace. The person has one birthplace. A birthplace can have many people. The cardinality can be expressed with just a symbol. So you know the whole one N, M, N, N thing? There's actually a symbol that draws that for you. So you don't need to start guessing. And optionality. What is the minimum number of instances that is required for the relationship? So the options are obviously are zero or one. In other words, zero is optional. One is mandatory. Each end of a relationship line will have two different markers. The markers denote cardinality and optionality. And here's the four symbols. So for crow's foot, you only ever need to memorize four symbols for the relationship. So there's not a lot of symbols to memorize. And they are as follows. One and only one. So that's the first one, which is two straight lines, you know, two cross hatches on a single line. It means that this item is required and they're only allowed to ever have one. For example, back to our um, person and birthplace example. Actually, you know what? I'll just draw it on the board to make it easier. Okay, 
person and birthplace. Okay, originally we would have written it like this, right? So each person has one birthplace, each birthplace can have many people. So the way we do it with crow's foot would be each person has one birthplace and they must have a birthplace. So the symbol closest here, so this guy to here, means the maximum. This one is the minimum. Now on the other side, we can say many. And in theory, we could say it's mandatory because so each birthplace can have many people. And the reason I said it's mandatory to at least have one person is if nobody was born there, is it really a birthplace? Chicken before the egg? But realistically, if nobody was ever born there, it's not a birthplace, right? So each person has one and only one birthplace. Each birthplace has at least one person born there, and they may have more than one. So that's the first two symbols we have. Now, um, hmm. I'm just trying to come up with an example for um, zero or more. Yeah, we can go with that. That works. No, we're not even going to get into that. Let's go with uh, was not going to go into that political debate. Um, so this is safer. <laughs> um, all right. So we have goose and eggs, right? So an egg only ever comes out of one goose. And it probably, you know, has to come out of a goose. So again, we're going to stick to the mandatory. But the goose, as you notice, I'm not specifying what kind of goose, right? Can have many eggs or no eggs at all. So a goose can have zero or more eggs. But an egg has to come from a goose and probably only comes from one goose because that'd be really weird to watch otherwise. All right, so this is the zero or more. Um, I've heard this called uh, zero or more, zero one or more. Realistically, those things mean the same thing. I've just seen it called both over the years. And we now have the last example, which is. Right? We already talked about the student locker thing. So a student at most can have one locker and it's optional they have the locker. And we also know that a locker can only ever belong to one student technically. And it's also optional because sometimes somebody doesn't rent out that locker. And brings us to our zero or one. In other words, at most we can have one, but it's possible to have none. So zero or one is our last crow's foot symbol. These four symbols literally covers all the types of relationships you can define in a database. There's actually one more, um, which is the many-to-many. -many. 
but that's just the same symbols being reused. Right, so if you have a course, actually, you know what? Uh, let's go like this. There, this is a many many. I mean, it's the same symbols you've already seen. It's nothing new. A student. To be a student, they must be enrolled in at least one course, but in theory, they could have multiple courses. Courses can exist without any students because the courses are created before students are enrolled. But a course can have zero, one, or more students. So if we were going to talk about many to many, that's what it looks like. But it's the same symbols we've already seen. We're not creating new ones for many to many. We're just using two that we already know about. So any questions about the, sim the symbols we're using? Concept-wise, they're not that complicated. The hardest part, like I said, will be, for most students, is learning which end the symbol is supposed to go on. Because at first you're learning and you're, you think, oh, you know, the one of many things. So we go back to the example of the goose. The goose and the egg. At first, students will often say, well, the egg only has one goose, so they'll tend to put the one on this side. It's just that whatever the relationship is for a given thing, it's always at the other end of the line to talk about how it participates in it. So, again, like such. You don't need to memorize the old one, but you should know how it was. No. No. It might show up on a test question saying, hey, which style of diagram is this? And you've got like an example of the old style diagram versus one that has, you know, a bit extra notation stuff on it, which is, you know, what kind of diagram is this? That's That's the extent of what you need to know. How do you convert that to a database? That's next week. <laughs> Baby steps. Yeah, no, next week is physical diagramming. Um, in other words, taking one of these and actually turning them into a database diagram you'd use in a database server. Uh, but this is at the design stage where you're starting to explore the data. You've got samples of the data. You've simplified it by normalizing it. Now you need to diagram it so you can present it to your clients to your boss, to whomever, so that you can explain what you understand of the data. And this gives you a chance to iterate and improve your your data environment. Yeah. Try that again. UML? Not in this class. UML is programming. This is database. No, UML is about class diagrams. and object-oriented programming. They're not the same thing. It's, they're very similar, but that's like saying uh, a bicycle is a motorcycle. They both have two wheels. They both get you somewhere. How they, What they do is very different, and their purpose is very different. One lets you exercise. One gets you speeding tickets. Any other questions? Going once, twice, three times. All right. Um, well, I already did all these examples on the board with better examples, but here's a um, slide deck, a slide that ex basically explains how these symbols work uh, without the diamond. Uh, some people choose not to put the diamond in. Okay. So here's that. Yep. 
the diamond just denotes relationship. See, the problem is with this version of it, which it's just on there to because there's not a lot of room on the slide. Honestly, if I were to redo this slide, I'd include the diamond, but this is an older slide that I didn't redo completely because it was self sufficient. The problem is that if you don't include the diamond, you can't show things like identifying relationships. They're not, it's not an option. You can't describe the relationship with it. All right, so here is our fully described version of all of those different symbols that we've seen. Um, this first one here we saw earlier because I used it in one of the other slides, but we expanded upon it to include course enrollments. So we have a course, which is a strong entity. There's a course number and description. That's cool. The student is a strong entity. That's cool because the student can exist without anything else defining it, technically. But the course enrollment is a weak entity because it is unable to exist without a student and a course. Right? Can you can a student be enrolled in a course without a student? Can a course enrollment exist without a course? No. Therefore, course enrollment is a weak entity. Technically, if we want to really talk about it, it would be an associative entity also. Um, but in this case, it's not. So on the next diagram further to the right, we have, again, um, an order, products, and order lines. And the shipping method you know, is a regular relationship. The order line is an associative entity. Now, the reason when I did this diagram, I decided to not make this one an associative entity is I decided that all there was going to be in the course enrollment was the student number and the course number. No extra attributes. It's really stupid to do it that way, but, you know, there's no other attributes in it. Therefore, it's known as an intersection table, and it's a purely weak entity. It, it has nothing else in it. On the other hand, in this example over here where we have the associative entity um, at the bottom right, the reason why I decided it was an associative entity is when you look at an order line, you normally have a few things. The quantity that you're buying. Uh, potentially, is there a discount on what you bought? When you go to Loblaws and you buy stuff, there is never a quantity line except for weight, right? You go to the grocery store. And I, so you go to the grocery store and you buy stuff. You buy three boxes of cereal. It's all the same cereal, but they'll be on the receipt three times. You buy bananas. It'll show, you know, so much per pound at this weight. But even then, you'll ever only have one entry for bananas because they'll put all the bananas in as a single thing. On the other hand, you go and you buy, you're going to put up a greenhouse in your backyard. You're not going to buy a kit. You are going to completely build it yourself. And you're going to place an order from Home Depot. When you receive your invoice from Home Depot and you have, I don't know, 48 two by fours. There will be two by four by eight, 48. And if you get a discount because, you know, your contractor or whatever, there might even be a percentage number on there showing a discount. An order line can have many things on top of just product and order. So that's why it's an associative entity because it expands upon the relationship between the two objects. An associative entity normally is a weak entity because it can't live with anything else. But the fact that it's doing it like this is showing that it's basically weak because it's a relationship and an entity at the same time. That's why it's an associative entity. All right. So, yes, let's go back. Yep. Right here.
It is. It is. It's just when I was doing this originally, I included here to show you guys that this is one or many. Right? To just because the original version of this diagram, so I've used this diagram a few semesters. I, this used to be two separate slides. And in there, normally you wouldn't put one or one or many. Some people do, some people don't. Normally what you put inside the relationship here is a description of the relationship itself. So student, in here you put in the word enrolled. Course, you could probably say, you know, I have some other word to describe enrolled. Um, order contains order line. Product ordered by order line kind of thing. You can put whatever you want in there. Different people will do different things. It all depends, A, when you, where you went to school, two, what your boss tells you to do. Somebody laugh, but it's the truth. Like some places they have ways of doing things and they'll tell you how they want it done. You do it that way. Some people choose to put nothing at all in there and just have the symbols with nothing in it. It's up, it's dealer's choice, as they say. It's it's optional. It just depends. But the diamond should be there, yes. The diamond is just saying relationship because it allows you to do identifying or not identifying. I mean, sorry, just a normal relationship or an identifying relationship. An identifying relationship is when the primary key, the identifier from this one, is carried down into the child entity. You will notice that I don't have the foreign keys in any of these. Because the relationship assumes that there will be foreign keys eventually. So you only have the attributes that belong to the entity. No, no foreign keys. Any other questions on the diagram? Well, considering the software you're going to use to do these diagrams is going to put the diamond in for you. Yes. Um, I am old school. I like the old notation. I've been doing this for almost 30 years now. It's the old notation was good for a reason. Um, what's happening is a lot of software now is starting to drop some of the older notation because it's one less object they need to draw on screen. That means it's one less set of ge geometric shapes that they need to track in memory. And if you have less things to track in memory, that means it's going to perform better and it's going to be, you know, less buggy. But this diagram notation has been around since the 70s. Well, this one would be early 80s. It's good because it is explicit. Any other questions? Going once, twice, three times. Okay. So characteristics of a good conceptual model. So the ideal conceptual model will provide a high-level overview of the system slash database to be built. Its purpose is to give a non-technical person a way to understand the data. It's going to be a blueprint that can be referred to during the, the whole project. So as you start developing, you can refer back to the conceptual diagram to say, huh, this is the decisions we made here. Now we're looking at this and it's not quite the same. And it gives you a chance to, you know, refer back to a simplified uh, diagram. It avoids, avoids technical considerations or terminology. You'll notice that based on this, if I didn't have all those labels, as long as you knew what the symbols meant, you don't need any terminology on in the presentation for it. Once you explain to someone what these things are, and realistically, when you're dealing with managers or clients, you might actually want to drop some of the more complicated symbols like the uh, the weak entity or the, associate, uh, the um, identifying relationship. We might not even want to include those because it might be too much to explain to a client. But the basic symbology of, you know, rectangles, ovals, and diamonds can be explained really quickly. It can be used. Oh, yeah. It prevents the model from being locked to a particular database management system. At this point, it's completely abstract. It is not tied to any technology. Um, 
as someone who has worked in the industry for a long time, one of the companies I work for, uh, we started out with the database being created for Microsoft SQL Server. Then we discovered that Microsoft updated their licensing terms and it was going to be horribly expensive to run it on my, my uh, Microsoft SQL Server. Uh, their licensing at the time was for every person accessing the database you needed a license. This was for a website with n number of users. That means for every time we enrolled a user, we had to buy a license for Microsoft SQL Server. That's $60 a piece. Considering that the product was $5 a month, basically the year would pay for their license. So we migrated from that to something from a product from Sybase, and then we moved from that to Postgres. And the we actually had conceptual models and the conceptual models didn't care what it's running on because it's high level and abstract. So you can use it to get feedback from non-technical stakeholders. You can take this diagram, explain what the notation means, sit down with you know, non-technical people and explain to them what you're doing with the data and what you understand of the data. I've discovered that that particular stage is a really interesting moment that your clients themselves don't actually understand their data either. And it gives them a chance to actually understand the underlying data that makes their business work or their dreams do what it's supposed to do. And then they start realizing some of the implications of what their data actually means because you're giving it to them in a visual layout. And then once you've got a good conceptual diagram, you have a very solid foundation for creating proper logical than physical diagrams. Because if all your entities and your relationships are defined, most of your attributes are defined, then you can go from that to the logical slash physical diagram fairly painlessly because you've already got all the bits and pieces figured out. All right, so last week we di we normalized that you know library lending thing. Today we're going to diagram it just so you can see what the next step is over what we did from the normalization. Now, I'm going to be using the website called ERD Plus. It's one I had you guys sign up for. Uh, you'll notice mine doesn't have any ads uh, because I got an ad blocker running. So if you don't want any ads, you block Origins fantastic to save your grief. It just really messes with YouTube. Um, so on here, I'm going to create a new diagram, and it's going to be an ER diagram. And I'm going to call this uh, Lecture 3. And I'm going to hit Create. I'm going to click on it. And we have ourselves our canvas. So in here, we have one, two, three, four, five entities. So I'm going to drop five entities onto my diagram. One, two, three, four, five. Now I'm going to start with my first entity, which is a genre in this case. Over here, you get to give its description. And then we have author. Um, we got book, borrower, and book lend, I called it. Like such. Okay. So here's my five entities. So if we were going to go with the old way of diagramming, which is what I'm going to do first, because this tool is fantastic for this. It's literally a website created just for doing conceptual diagrams. So I'm gonna reorganize things a little bit because the genre belongs to the book, so does the author. So we'll put this over here for now. We'll leave the bar over here and put the book land over here. Now, if we want to show the relationships, there's the connect button. So you click on connect, you click on the first one, you click on the second one. Whoops, there you go, you drag and drop. Drag and drop, drag and drop. 
drag and drop. All right, so this looks pretty close to that original Chen style diagram, except there isn't a spot to put the, right on the diagram, the one or n. So this is where you'd populate in the whole um, one to many. Because I'm going to get as close to the original notation style as we had. And then in a minute, I'll expand it. Okay. So at this point, this is very much the 1976 flavor of the Chen diagram. No extra meat and potatoes, just the entities and how they're connected, and a small description of what the relationship is. Cool. So for you guys that are doing your labs with this, here's your first pro tip. Please don't take screenshots of this. It's an option. There's an option for exporting the image. It's so much more easy for me to read when you export the image than when you take a screenshot because those of you with high resolution displays, <coughs> Mac users, um, your diagrams come in and they're either this big and then the browser shrinks it to that big and I can't read it. Or it starts out that big because you took a screenshot of just that. Um, use the export tool. Then you hit save and it downloads and it looks like this. Um, oh, it cut off the bottom a little bit. Oh, well. That's fine. Um, what? No. The good news is this tool saves everything as you go. <laughs> so if you're stupid and you accidentally double click like I just did, because I know you should make fun of people that double click so that I feel really stupid right now. Um, the web browse, web tools don't need double clicking for anything. Um, but yeah. All right. So here's our basic Chen style diagram. Now we are going to modernize it. We're going to add all the attributes. So if we come back to our thing, we're going to start with the genre. And we have the genre ID and the genre name. So we're going to add attributes. If you look over here, there's an option for add attributes. If you click on that, it'll pop out an attribute right out of it automatically. And this was the genre ID. We have the option to mark it as unique. What is unique? It's also known as an identifier. We're going to add another attribute. And that was the genre name, just like such. Now, here's the other cool part about this tool. It it moves things that are connected together. Um, makes reorganizing your diagram way easier. All right, so again, author, we're gonna add an attribute. It's the author ID and the author name, like such. Uh, the borrower, which we have the just the ID and the name, so we're going to add two attributes. And that's unique, and we are going to go name, like such. Um, it has a book ID, and do we have anything else on the book? Uh, and the book title. And just like that. And I'm not putting in the foreign keys, you'll notice. Oh, by the way, book ID is supposed to be the primary key. Just like that. Now, we have, um, like I said, on the conceptual diagram, you don't add the foreign keys. Why? Because the relationships imply there's foreign keys. Foreign keys are more of a physical design or a logical design step. So, you know, at the conceptual st stage, you don't worry about what the connection is. You just worry about that they're connected. So, and our last one is the book Lend, which has the two IDs, which is going to be interesting, the borrow date and the return date. So here's a question. Can a book being lent out be lent out if there's no book? 
No. Can it be lent out if there isn't somebody borrowing it? Is it being lent if the one's taking it? No. Right? It can be lent, but it's not being lent if nobody took it. Therefore, this is a weak entity because the book lend cannot exist without a book, and it cannot exist without somebody borrowing it. So here we'd mark it as a weak entity. And the fact that if we look at our original normalization here, we'll notice that the book ID and the borrower ID are both primary key and foreign key. That means that these relationships are identifying. And now on the book lend, we're going to add uh, the two last items, which is, uh, is it, uh, borrow date and the return date, I think. Yeah, just like that. All right. Now we have an almost fully completed modern, air quotes around the word modern, conceptual diagram. Because this is modern because it comes from like 1983. This one here, I've marked off the identifying tag. Okay. So the last thing we have left to do is actually putting in the crow's foot notation. So I am going to change the description of the relationship. In this case is an author writes a book. And down here, we can set our rules. Okay, so an author has a book, must have an author. Has anybody here ever experienced a book written by more than one author? Anybody here ever opened up a textbook? How many names are in most textbooks? There's usually at least one, but I've most school textbooks have two or three. Why? Because the book was originally created by one person. And then they have other authors coming in later, revised in the textbook, and then they get to put their name on it too. So in this case is we have a mandatory one to many. In other words, there must be at least one author. And they are there could be multiple authors for every given book. And on the other side, is a person an author if they never wrote a book? No. And odds are they may have written at least one book, but they may have written many books. So the relationship is one to many. Now, if you look at our genre, a book would belong to multiple genres, right? Oops, we're going the wrong way. Darn, stop. And leave that back to unspecified. Okay, so let's go the other way. A genre can have many books. In theory, it could be optional in the sense that um, a new genre has been created, but there's no books. That, that sounds totally stupid to say it that way, but theoretically, somebody could say, come up, I'm going to write the next, next great novel, and it's going to be this genre of book. And then they reach behind and out of their rear, pull out a new kind of book. Pretty much every kind of book already exists. But say somebody comes up with something totally novel. Okay. And the genre is... Every book has to have at least one genre. In theory, books could belong to multiple genres. It's one of many. So a book has to have at least one genre. But it could also have multiple genres. Uh, because that it's mandatory. The book must have at least one genre, but it could have multiple. For example, the book Dianetics. Most people might not know what that is, but you know, it's the book that created Scientology. It is fiction, it is comedy, and it is religion all in one. It is also bullshit, but you know, that's not a category you see in the library. That's why it's fiction and comedy, but people made a religion out of it. Yes. And hopefully there's no Scientologists in the room. <laughs> I'll get canceled. 
a weak entity is weak because it can't exist without something else. Which is you a book lend record cannot exist without it cannot exist without a book, and it cannot exist without somebody that's being lent to. It's like a loan and a payment. A payment's a weak entity because you can't pay a loan that doesn't exist. Okay. Um like that. So now we're going to go with uh, the relationship for book to book lend. Um, and we'll put in the word borrowed. And each book can be lent, um, which size is going to be? Potentially never lent, because the book might have just come in, it's never been borrowed. So that means it's potentially never lent, so therefore being lent is optional. A book can be lent multiple times because the person is not buying it, they're borrowing the book. On the other hand, each lend must have a book and it's only for one book because we're, even though you check out four books, there'll be four records. How many of you have borrowed a book from a library in the last like little while? Okay, how many of you have borrowed books from a library? Good, okay. I don't know how libraries are surviving. I really don't know. Um, but sometimes, like with the Ottawa Public Library, when they get new books in, they'll have what they call a fast return. I, they had another name. But essentially, you borrow the book, but you only have it for seven days. Because it's a brand new book that's going to be in demand, and they don't want people holding on to it for months. So therefore, it's a fast return book. You borrow it for seven days and you must return it within seven days. You borrow another book, it's been there for a while, you'll get the normal, say, 30-day lend period. Therefore, you borrowed two books, it'll be two different lending records because they have two different return dates. That's why it's one and only one, and it must have a book. And same thing with a borrower. Um, in theory, you go to the library, you get your library card, you never borrowed a book. The borrower can exist without ever having borrowed a book. Um, therefore, it's optional many because they can borrow many books. For example, uh, I know for a fact my neighbor across the street, they have an Ottawa Public Library card, but they've never borrowed a book. Why do they have that? Because they actually go to Centerpoint to use their laser engraver that you can use for free. You just take a course, which is free. Or you can go and use their 3D printers for free. You just pay for so much material. And I actually, you get enough to do a fairly decent structure for free with the first print. Cool beans. They have, they use the card for other things. So in theory, a borrower at a library could have a membership without ever actually borrowing anything. Unless you count using the 3D printer as a you're borrowing the printer, but you're not taking it home. Um, and same thing with the book lend. It's mandatory, one, because each lend period is only ever to one person, and you can't lend it unless there's a person associated to it. So, and then if we can call this borrows. And now we have ourselves a fully diagrammed version of last week's normalization exercise. So we went from unstructured garbage data to a diagram, which you could take to someone that's non-technical and explain to them what happened to the data. How how is it broken down? Which is why the, I decided to move normalization around because now it it feeds into this very well. So any questions about some of the decisions I made while I was doing the diagramming? You'll notice that I was doing decisions the entire time and I was explaining to you guys why I was making those decisions. When you take these diagrams and you now go take your little diagram and you go to your manager and you go, here's what I did, you're probably gonna have to explain some of the decisions you made. And that's the thought process behind. That's why I was verbalizing what I, why I was picking these things, because I'm showing you guys what the thought process was behind some of these decisions.
it doesn't come naturally when you first start, I'll admit. But eventually, if you do it enough, it just happens automatically. Like, you don't need to think about every decision you make. Okay. Now, I'm going to export this. So I also have a copy for this because I'll try to remember to upload. And I'm going to just create another diagram really quick. Just show you guys some of the other attribute types. So I'm going to slap an entity. I'm going to add an attribute. Um, okay, that one we've seen before. Okay, I'm not going to... Oh, take it. Um, I'm going to put in their name. Okay, you're going to leave that one alone. Now I'm going to add the address one. Okay, so this is a composite one. And you'll notice when I turn to composite that it added another button for me. So this is add a component. So I'm going to add a street address city. No, that's not derived. Province. Problems are not derived. Yeah, you'd think that I uh, suck at using a mouse watching me right now, but uh, it's because it's on a slant and you can see the mouse slowly moving across the screen. Every time I let go, the mouse is moving around on me, so it gets a little weird. So here's another cool feature. Even when it's a combined composite attribute, it takes the whole thing with it. Then you can still move each piece, but it moves the whole thing with it. So that's really nice. Um, we get at an attribute here saying that it's uh, uh, derived, such as an age. And um, the other ones would be um, the comps that we did, optional, we, we showed. So this is a fax and it's optional. And we're gonna add one more, which is the multi-valued. So multi-valued is one I didn't actually have on the slides describing earlier. Uh, because it's not a common one that you see, um, none of the exercises you guys have will require um, multi-valued. And it's not going to show up on any tests because, it's not, like I said, it's not something you tend to see very much. Um, but multi-valued is when it's a list of values associated to a person. The thing is, is that if you've already done normalization, there are no multi-valued attributes. And if you do normalization before you do the conceptual diagram, you'll never need to diagram it. If you go the other way around where you do a diagram because your data is not normalized or you don't even have data to work with because you're starting from scratch, in theory, you might have a multi-valued one. Um, now, the other entity types you've seen is regular, weak, and associative. I've shown you guys. A uh, super type is... Um, when you get to get really nitty gritty in the database design, we don't even cover super types at all in this course. Um, I'd actually have to go back to the textbook and reread what the definition of super type is. Uh, that's just how much I've used it. Um, but yeah, this tool covers absolutely everything. Oh, and the last thing that's missing, one moment, is the label. Um, you can guess what that's for, and you can make it bigger. Let's put your name on the diagram when you submit it. Okay, did you have a question? No, the address is a composite. Age, yeah, oh, sorry, yeah. Now it is. I just didn't put one in. I was just showing you what the symbols were and where the buttons were to make them. So now we have a date of birth. No. No, sometimes we'll have a derived attribute that doesn't actually have anything yet. Um, there could be times where you have a derived attribute because it's getting its values from a different entity. So, so it doesn't always mean that a derived attribute 
gets its values from the same entity. It might actually come from multiple entities put together. It's just we put it there at this stage so that we don't lose any information. No, no, we're just saying we're not, we don't want to lose this particular piece of information because the source of this, inf like the source of your diagram, like the data you were given or the information you were given to create this diagram included something like an age. We don't want to lose that fact at the conceptual stage. Therefore, we'd put it in and we go, hey, the perfect example is a Wikipedia page about a person. You know how they have the date of birth? And often they'll have an age field that just shows how old they are. I guarantee that Wikipedia isn't calculating people's age every day. It's literally, every time you pull up the person's record, it probably calculates it on the fly, right? Now minus current year minus year of birth equals how old they are. But there's times where the derived attribute may come from multiple entities at once. A good example would be, again, back to our grocery store receipt. Your bananas are 79 cents a pound. Therefore, the derived attribute would be the, the line cost, right? So 1.5 pounds times 79 cents is equal to what the line price is. We wouldn't be storing the price of the banana in that line theoretically, because it's but we're calculating it based on a value from another table. The line total, on the other hand, would be stored in this case. But the line total is derived because it's coming from multiple sources, depending on a variety of things. All right. Any questions? No, a derived means it's calculated using other data in the same database. If it can be, so an attribute is not derived is if you have to use an external source of the database to figure out its value. So in theory, um, the, I'm trying to come up with a, an easy real world example here off the top of my head, hang on. And I'm not. Uh, uh, but essentially, imagine you have a value in the database, and there's some external for uh, external piece of data that's not stored in that database. That once you take the value in the database plus whether external value, will give you a calculated value. In that case, that calculated value would need to be stored because it's not actually derived. When a value is derived, it means that it can be calculated using data that's 100% contained within that database structure. Usually within the same table, but not always. So a derived attribute is an attribute that can be calculated using other data in the same database. Data birth is the best example. Um, another example would be if you've got a, a standard uh, order line. Um, standard order line. Uh, in a simple system, we'll often have um, the product, the quantity, the discount, and the price. Okay? So, and then at the end, we'd have our uh, line total. Okay, and our line total would be derived because the math would be, I have my columns in a stupid order, but if we went price minus discount times quantity, we can calculate the line or total based on the values in the table. The order of the columns means nothing. It's the formula that calculates it. Um, high performance systems will actually store the derived value for performance reasons where, you know, if we, Amazon, for example, stores the line totals for everything. Why? Can you imagine the order volume if they had to recalculate every single time somebody looked at their order? Right. They're going to store it 
for performance reasons. Uh, but for, when you're doing the initial design, derived attributes usually are not included because we're trying to reduce the amount of database space we're using. Um, and the cool part about this is someday they might decide to change how the math works. Right? Because in theory, you could do the exact same thing with the same data based on price times quantity minus discount. Same data, different formula. Theoretically, the same result, but not always. And in here, we could also apply, you know, how's the discount calculated? Is it a percentage, a flat discount, et cetera? And that could come from somewhere else in the database. And in theory, this one could also be derived, right? Um, just database design can just keep growing and growing and growing depending on what your needs are. But yeah, this is the example of a you know, real world derived setup. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so um, take a guess what the next lab is. You got a diagram. Um, let me just go pull it up really quick. Scrolled way too fast. All right, so we have, um, so, oh, I need to update this because this is not in my school workbench. So you, the good news is, is for this lab, you'll be able to start working on it and then you'll have to finish it after next week's lecture. Um, I may have to adjust due dates actually, now that I realize it. Um, where is it? Somewhere in here. I'll show you guys how to use Vertibello next week. Okay. So you'll be able to start on this lab. Um, I, like I said, I'll probably have to go adjust the due date because you need two lectures to do it. But um, you'll be able to do part one right away. Um, and this is based on the lab one, or, well, sorry. Um, well, lab two solution, actually. So remember I was talking about how there was a uh, quickly updated. So I've provided the solution to lab two at the end of lab four so that you can start, everybody starts at the same point, which, you know, not everybody would have the same solution to that lab you will all start with the same starting point. And you'll take that and diagram it, conceptual diagram. And then later on, you'll be able to turn it into a physical diagram with a different tool after I cover that next week. Okay, um, outside of that, I think that's it, folks. Um, that's literally it for today. <laughs>